Um, Prynhanda Akroiso, good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us for this will writing webinar which we are hosting in conjunction with Geldards. Apologies for the slight delay, my internet connection decided to drop out which is always wonderful. Um, but welcome again and thank you for joining us. My name is Sarah and I am the Legacy and In Memory Officer here at Cardiff University and again it is my pleasure to welcome you to the webinar. A few housekeeping rules before we begin. Um, as mentioned the webinar is being recorded and the link will be available available following the session and an email will be sent out to you in a post event email next week. The Q&A function will be available once the presentation starts. Thank you so much to those who've submitted questions in advance. We've had a lot, which is always brilliant. And I know that Laura, who's presenting today, has tried to answer as many as possible within her presentation. Um, however, I'm hoping we'll have some time at the end of the session after the presentation to answer any additional queries. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Laura Eichen, who is a Cardiff graduate. Um, Laura is an associate solicitor at Geldards and she specialises in providing advice in relation to wills, lasting powers of attorney, tracks, tra trusts, tax and estate planning. Over to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Sarah. Welcome back. Um, Pranam Da, good afternoon. I'm Dale Kumbara on board. Thank you very much for attending um, and thank you for having me. So today I'll be talking about wills, why you need one, things to think about when you're preparing a will, um, information that I would need and um, also touching a bit on inheritance tax as well and some other useful points that might be handy for you to know. Um, so I hope you enjoy and find it useful. Um, I'll start sharing. I've got a presentation here, so I'll start by sharing that and um, go from there then. Here we go. So here we go. Um, to give you a bit of uh, background information about Geldards, we're one of the UK's leading law firms. Um, we have offices in Cardiff, London, Derby and Nottingham um, and we provide legal advice on a really broad range of areas and to a really broad range of clients um, from private clients, public sector, um, individuals, business owners and families. Um, and as Sarah said I'm an associate there and I've been there for a, a few years now um, and my area of specialism is wills and inheritance tax planning and trust. So moving on to the importance of making a will. Why do you need one? And um, it gives you peace of mind. It's the only way to ensure that the correct people are benefiting from your estate in the most appropriate way and in a tax efficient way. Without a will, the intestacy rules would apply and you can leave behind a legal headache, possibly an unnecessary tax bill, and quite likely um, unnecessary solicitor's fees as well. Um, and it's important to note that if you do have a will, it's important that you keep it under review regularly. So every few years or as and when things happen in life, it's a good time then to just check what it says um, and speak with the solicitor and um, just make sure everything's in order. Um, there's some very common points that I hear very often as to why people think that they perhaps don't need a will. Um, I'm married, so my spouse automatically receives everything. Um, we've been together years, so we're common law, husband and wife or common law spouses. Um, or I live with my partner, but I'm not really sure I'm ready for a serious commitment. Um, in all these scenarios, you still need a will. Um, none of them are true. So, I mentioned just looking at intestacy quickly because I mentioned that and I think it's important to know what happens if you don't have a will. Um, if there is a surviving spouse, then um, if there are no children under the intestacy rules, everything would pass to the surviving spouse. If there are children, then um, personal possessions would pass to a spouse up to the first £270,000 would pass to the spouse. And then after that, it's only, well, everything above that is divided in half and half goes to 
the surviving spouse, the other half actually goes to children. And some people say, well, actually, that's not bad. That's kind of what I would want to happen anyway. But the downside is, just from a very practical point of view, it can result in either minor children, so young children, part owning um, a house with a surviving spouse, or even adult children taking ownership, co-ownership with a surviving spouse. And it can just make things like dealing with the house and selling it and um, just you know general day-to-day dealings quite difficult to deal with uh, and manage for the survivor. If there are no, if there isn't a surviving spouse and there are no surviving children, um, then the intestacy rules kind of filter their way through the rest of the family. So the estate would either first of all go up to parents and if they're not alive it goes to siblings or half siblings and then grandparents so it finds its way down the family line. Um, and it's really important to note that if you are cohabiting, but you're not married, um, your partner or your cohabitee has no entitlement whatsoever. So the only way to make sure that they are provided for is by doing a will. For example, if you live together and you co-own a property together and one of you dies, the survivor only owns their share share of the person that has died um, can pass under the intestacy rules either perhaps up to parents or siblings and it can make it really difficult then to deal with. So the only way then, the only route for them to be able to, to get something or perhaps stake their right to be able to stay in the property would be to bring a claim against the estate of the deceased and that is a court process um, it's obviously upsetting, it's costly, it's not something that's, you know, particularly nice to go through. There are some assets that pass outside of a will, so they don't need to be governed by the will. Um, they are jointly owned assets, so things like um, if you own a property as joint tenants, it automatically passes to the survivor if one person dies. Same with like joint bank accounts or joint savings accounts. So if one person dies and they own the joint bank account, the, the, the balance of the bank account passes automatically to the other person. Other things that pass outside of a will are um, generally pensions, so pension pots, death and service benefits, and life insurance policies. The key point with those is that you need a nomination form um, to make sure that the proceeds of those policies pass outside of your estate and will be paid then directly to the people that you nominate as beneficiaries. So it's a really valuable planning tool. And um, also those three things, pensions, death and service and life insurance, if there is a nomination form in place, they don't form part of your estate for inheritance tax. So in terms of inheritance tax planning, again, they're kind of a really valuable and useful way to pass money on down the generation without it forming part of your estate for inheritance tax. Um, so mentioning inheritance tax, I thought it would be helpful to give a brief overview of the position. I think lots of people always want to know what their position is. Um, so every individual has what's known as a nil rate band of 325,000 um, pounds. And that is the amount that a person can leave tax-free. Everything above that 325,000 pounds is subject to inheritance tax, which is taxed at a rate of 40%. So it's quite hefty. Um, but there are some exceptions and there are some extra allowances to, to allow more to pass inheritance tax-free. Um, in the last few years, the government introduced what's known as the residence nil rate band. So instead of just keeping everything very simple and increasing the 325,000 to make things easy, they, um, they didn't do that. So they've kept the nil rate band, but um, introduced this extra allowance that says, um, if you meet certain criteria, you get an extra amount on top of the 325. 
So the residence nil rate band, as it says, attaches to a property. And the criteria are if you own a property or have owned a property on your death, that property is passing to what's known as direct descendants. So it's children, grandchildren, stepchildren, and a few other groups and categories in the family line. And the value of the estate on death is under £2 million. Then you can claim an additional up to £175,000. Um, so when you add together your £325,000 and your £175,000 residence nil rate band, it brings the total that an individual can claim up to £500,000. There's also a spouse exemption. So if you're married or in a civil partnership and you leave everything to your spouse, generally there's no inheritance tax to pay at that point in time. Um, and then there's also the benefit that spouses can roll over their um, allowances between them. So um, in that instance, for example, if a husband died, left everything to his wife, um, there'd be no inheritance tax to pay between them, even whether it's £10,000 they left or £10 million, um, there wouldn't be inheritance tax on the first death. When the wife then died, she would be able to claim her £325,000 and potentially her £175,000, so that's £500,000 for her. And then because the husband's allowances were unused, that rolls over as well. So usually a married couple with kind of mid-level of assets can usually claim a million pounds inheritance tax-free on second death. Um, there's a charity exemption. So any um, payments, any gifts that you make to charity are free of inheritance tax. There's also a relief that applies to business or agricultural property. Um, so any business or agricultural property that does satisfy certain criteria. There are points that need to be looked at, but that is potentially free of inheritance tax as well. And then everyone has lifetime gift allowances. So you can make small gifts throughout the year on customary occasions to as many people as you want. And you also have an annual allowance of £3,000 that you can give every year. And then um, as well as that, there are gifts that fall under the seven year rule, which I'm sure lots of people are familiar with or have heard about. And they are known as potentially exempt transfers. And all that means is if you make a gift in your lifetime, say you made a gift of £100,000 to um, a child, provided you live for seven years from the date of that gift, that £100,000 falls out of your estate for inheritance tax purposes. So there's quite a quite a few exemptions or allow extra allowances available on top of that nil rate band. Um, talking a bit more about giving to charity and the benefits of it, um, lots of people use their will as an opportunity to kind of think about who else they might want to benefit. Um, and it's quite often something that people don't initially think about, but um, once they're prompted, um, it's, it is more common for them to start thinking about, oh, you know, outside of family and friends, is there, is there a charitable organisation or something that I want to help out and, and give money to? Um, the main advantage of leaving, well, there's a few main advantages, but one of the advantages of leaving money to charity, also, as well as obviously helping the organisation, is from a tax point of view, um, as I said, any gifts to charity are free and exempt of inheritance tax. And also there is, if you give a certain percentage of your estate, which is around about 10%, it's a, quite a complex calculation, but if we say, if you give around about 10% of your estate to charities or charitable organization, it actually brings the rate of inheritance tax down from 40% to 36%, um, which can make quite a difference. Um, and the best way to show this is just through a few illustrations, which I've done here. Um, one of my colleagues does this, and he chooses Shakespearean characters, which is not my area of, uh, of knowledge or interest. So I thought I'll choose something quite obvious. 
So I've gone here with um, Mr. Bale, who has an estate of two million pounds. Um, I think he's a surviving partner. So his wife has died and left everything to him. So he's got two million pounds in his estate. And you can see here, he's got his own nil rate band of 325,000. And this TNR, uh, transferable nil rate band, which is the third point down, that is the wife's nil rate band. So it's rolled over to him. And the same then for this resident's nil rate band, he's claiming his nil rate band and the, the late wife's transferable nil rate band. So between all the allowances, he's got a million pounds tax free. So his taxable estate is a million pounds. And if that's taxed at 40%, that's 400,000 pounds that goes to the government. Comparing that with Mr. Ramsey, um, he again has got an estate of two million pounds. Same as previously, his allowances are a million, but he's making a gift to charity of 140,000 pounds. So that is free of inheritance tax, which means his taxable estate is a bit less and the tax he is paying is a bit less. So it's 344,000 pounds. And then comparing that with one more scenario, um, Mr. Allen, um, his estate is again, two million, take away the million pound allowance. He's giving slightly more to charity. So he's giving 150,000 pounds, which is 10,000 pounds more than Ramsey did, um, which means he has triggered that reduced rate of inheritance tax. So his taxable estate is 850, is taxed at 36%. So he has reduced his tax bill, if you compare that to bail, by almost 100,000 pounds. So it can make a difference. I've got a little table here, which basically shows um, the amount that goes to charity, the amount that goes to family, and then the bottom bit is what is in um, what was going to the tax man. So in these instances, with Git Bale, his family get 1.6 million. Ramsey, his family get a bit less because charity is benefiting. Um, but with Alan, his family get a little bit more, the charity gets a little bit more, and the tax man gets a little bit less. So um, it's it can be quite useful. Um, it can be very beneficial in terms of tax, but I think it is something that is worth taking some advice on. Um, so in terms of wills and these, moving on to writing them, um, these are a lot of comments and questions that I receive as to why someone isn't doing a will or is kind of putting it off. So it could be my circumstances are complicated. I can't decide what I want to happen. I don't know who I want as guardians um, of my young children. It's something that, you know, I'll get around to one day. Um, and then some more here that I'm worried my son will split from his wife or my spouse will remarry and the children won't receive anything. Um, or if there's a business asset, is how do you treat children fairly if one is more involved in the business than the other? Um, or a family member, a child or grandchild has a disability and I'm worried about how I can provide for, for him or her. Um, or, you know, there's concerns about children receiving big amounts of money too soon, too much too soon. So all of these reasons I hear regularly from people who use them as a reason to not do a will when in actual fact they, they are a very good reason and you know very important reasons why they actually do need a will. So looking at the will planning process, um, if you came to me, I would do, we'd have a meeting or chat over the phone and would basically do a fact find around the value and makeup of your estate. Um, and I need to understand your family, the circumstances, objectives, concerns. This photo is probably slightly, <laughs> Um, oh well, it's it's the fact that I basically need to know about any skeletons in the closet. So um, it did make me laugh when I saw that. So it's a good way of remembering that I I need to know everything because there are certain things that can affect 
the way the will is drafted or how to implement your wishes. And it's better that I, I know everything and I can decide kind of what's important and what's not. Um, and then we'd kind of consider the range of options. So there are different types of will that you can prepare um, and would run through, you know, benefits of, of one type of will over another. Um, and the most important thing is that you as a client are making an informed choice. Um, whether it's what I recommend or not, my view is that I'm here to give you information and give you options and kind of set out the pros and cons of each option. But the most important thing is that you as a client are happy and you are doing what you want to do and making that informed decision. And then obviously we'll make sure that the will is signed and the relevant formalities are observed and followed. So looking at wills, I mentioned there are different types of wills. Um, the starting point is usually um, a pretty straightforward will, which would, might leave everything to um, a spouse or a partner or directly to your children. Um, and these are really straightforward. They're very kind of, I'm saying easy, they can, you know, they can be uh, some slight complications, but generally to draft and prepare, they're quite straightforward and quite comprehensive. Um, and from a tax point of view, if you are leaving everything to each other and you're married, you're structuring the will to make sure that you're benefiting from that transferable nil rate band that I've mentioned. Um, however, I always mention this to all clients, there are some downsides to a very straightforward will, um, depending on your stage of life, in that it's leaving the entire estate vulnerable to the circumstances of the survivor. So if um, if you're married and you left, the husband died, left everything to his wife, and the wife then either remarried or needed care, she's got the entire value of the estate in her name and is vulnerable to her decisions and her circumstances. So it could find its way, she could decide to leave it or, you know, without thinking, leave it to the new spouse. Or if she did need care, it can easily be swallowed up in care fees. Um, if you are an unmarried um, and um, are doing quite straightforward wills, there are actually some inheritance tax consequences to think about um, that aren't that favourable. Um, so it's important to take advice on that. Um, again, if you do a straightforward will, leaving everything to children, you can leave the children um, inheriting potentially quite a large sum of money at an inappropriate age. Um, and depending on the value of the estate, you are potentially creating inheritance tax bills that are being passed down generations where that could be avoided. So the way that you can add a bit more control and a bit more planning in your will is to include a trust. Um, and what a trust is, is essentially a way of making a gift with strings attached. So it allows flexibility and allows control as to how you provide for beneficiaries. Um, it allows them to benefit from the assets held in trust, but the asset or the money doesn't belong to that person. So it's not vulnerable to their circumstances um, or their decisions. So when we're looking at wills, these are the main types of will trusts. There are other types of trusts and you can set up trusts in your lifetime, but that's probably a whole other presentation. Um, so I'm focused now on um, the types of trusts that you would include in a will most commonly. And um, so they are life interest trusts, discretionary trusts, trusts for disabled beneficiaries, and then a nil rate band discretionary trust. So a life interest trust, is a really valuable, a really easy way to add some protection into your will. And I'm, um, I am always discuss this with clients because I think they work really well. So what that does in simple terms is um, generally this, these are most appropriate for tax reasons for married or um, couples in a civil partnership. So if one person um, dies and they have a life interest trust in their will, um, their half or their share of a property 
and any money or cash or savings or investments that are in their sole name would usually pass into this trust. And the trust is in existence for the lifetime of the surviving spouse or the surviving partner. Um, and they have, the survivor has a right to carry on living in the property. They have a right to benefit from any income generated from cash or savings or investments. But the capital value is protected in the trust. So if the survivor were to remarry or were to need care fees, it's only the money and the share of the house that's in their name that can be taken into account. The, the asset that is in the trust that they're benefiting from but is protected, that can't be taken into account. So it's a really good way of adding some protection. It works really well for a variety of scenarios. It's usually either people are concerned about the survivor remarrying or needing care, or it works very well if you're a family um, and you're in a second marriage and you've got children from previous relationships because it allows you to provide for your spouse for the rest of their life, but it ensures that there's some protection to make sure that your share of the state will eventually pass to your child or children after the, the surviving spouse has died. And then the other type of trust that we most commonly use and I most commonly discuss with clients is a discretionary trust. And what this is, is um, it allows a person to pass wealth on and pass their assets on in a really flexible way. Um, so it's a really good um, way to um, kind of give effect to more complicated wishes. Or if a client is quite unsure of the detail of actually how they want things to work, but they've got a general idea, then a discretionary trust allows a lot of flexibility in how things are divided and how beneficiaries benefit. Um, this is the type of trust that you would use if you were cohabiting and unmarried. You would use this trust to give this, the, the cohabitee or the surviving cohabitee or surviving partner the same kind of right as a life interest would give but for tax purposes, this is the better type of trust. So it would allow the, um, allows cohabitees to provide for each other without potentially creating some unnecessary tax bills. Um, we use discretionary trusts to pass assets on um, that qualify for business or agricultural property relief. Um, and the reason for that is that Business property relief and agricultural property relief for inheritance tax are really valuable because if you own a business or own assets that qualify for the relief, it allows those the value of those assets to pass um, through your estate or pass on without inheritance tax being paid on them. So it's important that you capture that relief at the earliest opportunity. So discretionary trust allows that. Um, and we also use a discretionary trust or a version of a discretionary trust to provide for vulnerable or disabled beneficiaries, because the main thing to think about with them, and it's really important, is that they are quite possibly either receiving a care package or receiving benefits. Um, and any inheritance that they have could affect the benefits and allowances that they are entitled to from the government. Um, or also it could be if they can't manage um, money or um, an inheritance themselves, it allows them to benefit from the assets held in the trust, but have someone else manage it for them. Um, I haven't covered the, the two types, the other two types that I mentioned, I haven't covered them. So I've covered disabled beneficiaries, nil rate band discretionary trust, just to touch on. They are a form of discretionary trust, but they are only designed to receive up to the nil rate band, which is £325,000. And they were more commonly used quite a number of years ago for inheritance tax planning, but they do sometimes have a place in planning these days, um, depending on uh, person's circumstances. Um, and just another thing to note with 
discretionary trust wills is it's always really important that um, you have a letter of wishes that sits alongside the will because the will creates the trust and is quite, um, it gives no detail really. It kind of sets out the terms of the trust and who the beneficiaries are, but the body of your wishes, what you want to happen is contained in a separate letter. And that is really important because obviously that is the instructions and guidance to your trustees. Um, so whenever we do a discretionary trust will, there is always a letter of wishes to go alongside it. Um, it's important to note just because of the way a discretionary trust is taxed and managed, um, the terms of the letter of wishes aren't binding on your trustees, but generally you pick trustees that you trust to follow through with your wishes. Um, so it's usually, it's not such a concern, but it's important to note that it's not actually legally binding um, on the trustees. And I think that brings my whistle stop tour of wills to an end, but one last point, um, I always pick up on and always advise on and it's really important as important as a will is to consider making lasting powers of attorney so a lasting power of attorney is a document that you prepare to um, give people authority so they're your attorneys to make decisions on your behalf if you lose capacity to make your own decisions there's two different types. There's one that covers property and financial decisions and another co that covers health and care decisions. Um, and they, they do, it's pretty obvious what they do. So property and finance allows your attorneys to make decisions about um, paying bills, dealing with property, perhaps selling a property on your behalf, dealing with a bank, paying money in, taking money out, um, all very practical um, and necessary things that you do day to day. Health and care covers things like where you live, treatment you receive, medication you receive, um, the kind of care setting that um, you know that you live in. Um, so it's it's more on that the social side of um, of things, and that would only ever kick in if you were unable to make those decisions yourself. Without a power of attorney, um, especially for property and finance, there is a risk of your assets being frozen um, if you were to lose capacity to manage them. And that's true even with joint accounts and joint savings accounts, bank accounts, um, dealing with the property. Even if you're married, um, if one person loses capacity to deal with their own affairs, it's becoming more common now because banks are far more heavily regulated um, and aware of the risks involved. Um, they will not hesitate to freeze at least part of an account if they become aware that a joint owner loses capacity. If you don't have a power of attorney in place and that does happen and someone loses capacity, um, the process is that um, you or the family would need to apply for a court order um, to the court of protection. So they apply for what's known as a deputy ship, which is essentially a court appointed attorney. But because the court have to satisfy themselves as to the suitability of who's being appointed and the responsibility that they'll take on, it's a really costly exercise it takes a really long time um and it's it's not a great process to be in um and then it is quite easily avoidable by preparing powers of attorney while you can so they give basically peace of mind um and i always say lasting powers of attorney are much like an insurance policy it's better to have it and hope that you don't need it um than not have them at all and find out it's too late when you do need it. Um, so there we go. I think in conclusion, that comes, that brings me to the end of my um, talk. So basically the message is don't put it off, make a will, um, or if you do have an existing one, make an appointment to review it just to make sure everything's in order. Um, it's 
always a good idea to seek specialist advice because there are so many ways that you could get tripped up or not take advantage of tax reliefs depending on the way your will is structured. So it's always a good idea to, to, to see a specialist who can um, give you appropriate advice and tailor wills in the best way possible and make lasting powers of attorney. And there we go. That brings me to the end. So I'll hand back over to Sarah now for questions. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. That was incredible. I got so much out of that. So I really hope everybody in attendance did as well. As I mentioned earlier, we have received quite a large number of questions. I know you've covered a lot of those off in your presentation. So thank you for that. Apologies if we do run out of time and we Aren't, are unable to answer your question. Geldards have really kindly offered all registered attendees a free 30 minute phone consultation. So details of how you can access that and speak to Laura and her colleagues will be available in the post event email, which will be sent out next week. So I'll go to some of the questions now. Yeah. So we've had one come in from somebody saying, I don't want to burden friends or family with being executor, but I am concerned that no one would approach the solicitors I appoint to be executor. How do solicitors find out about the death of people they are executors for um usually there will generally a person will either have a bank account um or a property and at some point someone will need to do something there'll be bills to be paid or there'll be if they're receiving a pension for example or income there will generally always be a trigger where someone you know realizes they need to um they need to check if there's a will they need to to discuss with the solicitor there are ways of checking um the best way though is if you've got a will is to just let friends family know even if they're not the executors to say look this these are who i've appointed i've appointed such and such i've appointed this firm of solicitors if anything happens to me you go to them um so there are there it's very very unusual for someone to kind of completely disappear off the face yeah. of the earth without okay. someone finding out. Um, and somebody else has asked, what's the difference between writing writing a will online yourself or getting a solicitor's advice doing this? It's, I mean, it's not I advisable. I mean, I, I can see there is perhaps a time and a place for them. I'm never a big fan because I think you can, someone can easily um make a mistake or it's very easy for someone to not sign the will correctly and if the the formalities of signing a will aren't um done completely correctly it's invalid um so you if you were king to me you would have the benefit of kind of tax advice and some options in terms of structure um and just to kind of make sure that what you're doing is actually the best way to achieve it whereas with an online will it is basically filling in a form um and potentially missing out on on you know some some advice some tax advantages or without realizing perhaps the repercussions of structuring your will in a certain way yeah i guess you leave yourself open then as well yeah, don't you? yeah. Not if it's not regulated it's it's much harder isn't it yeah. Um, I've got another one here. If you don't have family in the country, would a property automatically go to the family in the home country or would you need a will with all the relevant contact details as well? So the ideal is, I know we had quite a lot of questions about foreign property. Um, mm. So the, the kind of best advice is wherever you own a property, a fixed property, you should really have a will in that country because different countries have different rules um, and it can get quite complicated and it can cause a bit of a headache if you've got different countries with competing um, rules as to how assets pass on to family members. Um, if family members are abroad and the, the property is in the UK, it would, generally pass under the UK law but there's a lot of of nuances and there's a it very much depends on the circumstances of the individual so it's it's something that I would say take some advice on 
and I'd be more than happy to speak to someone um, if they they want to discuss it further, just to make sure that they have got the right structure in place to make sure that their property here passes where they want it to pass. Okay, great. I'm conscious of time, so I'll just do a couple more. Um, regarding tax-free exemption inheritance for spouses, does that apply for common law partners as well? There's no such thing as a common law partner in law. Um, it's a phrase that's kind of floats around, but it doesn't mean anything. In order to benefit from a spousal exemption, you either have to be married or in a civil partnership. Okay, thank you for that. I'll just ask one more quick one now. So, um, oh, somebody's asked, a Geldad's an international firm. So somebody's got a family member who live in another country and needs to get a will written, but doesn't have many legal contacts out there. What would sort of your advice be there? We we aren't in the sense that we don't have offices elsewhere, but we do work within a network of firms um, who have offices across the globe. So we can put you or put them in touch with um, a firm that you know is is part of our network. Um, and it, it really depends on their situation. I was going to say I've got a client who lives in Spain, but I've done a will for him here because he has assets here so it kind of depends again on someone's situation but um yeah I, we can definitely help or uh definitely put them in touch with someone who would be able to help okay i'll just ask one more then so if somebody died and they didn't have a will in place and the estate then passed to the young children as we've said there's complications within this but would the partner or the father of the children be able to access those funds as they guard a guardian i.e be able to look after them or is it a case of it just goes to the children and well it it depends how old they are they would legally be able to have it at 18 um usually the other spouse the, the or the other parent would have control of the money as the guardian but they would be under obligation to use it in the best interest of the children mm -hmm. they can't use it for i'm not saying they would use it for their own benefit but um it's you know you're under a duty they're essentially acting as a trustee and they have to hold that money for the benefit of the children only use it for their benefit yeah okay great thank you so much Laura I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all of the questions but as I said I'm conscious of everybody's time but please do take advantage of that free 30 minute consultation which will be sent out in the in the post event email so just leaves me to say thank you to everybody for attending today. Thank you to Laura and Galdards um, and for everybody for joining us on the webinar. Um, at Cardiff University, we have been incredibly lucky to have received some very generous gifts and wells. And as the legacy officer, I'm in the really privileged position to be able to see firsthand the difference that this type of giving makes. Um, the legacies that we've received to date have allowed us to achieve truly incredible things, such as helping students face financial hardship, funding life-saving equipment and um, several of our researchers are currently fully funded by legacies there are so many options when it comes to legacy giving and i'd love to be able to speak to you if you are interested in including a gift to a charity in your will and are thinking of cardiff university um, so feel free to pop me an email drop me a line and i'd be more than happy to set up a meeting and talk through the options that you've got and it would be lovely to chat to you uh, we're holding another one of these webinars with laura in october and all these details again will be included in your post event email next week um, please feel free to pass this information on to to anybody who you think would benefit from it or might be interested in attending this workshop and it'd be lovely to welcome you back to it if you if you'd like to attend again but thank you everybody once again for your time and have a lovely afternoon